What's up, everybody? Don't worry, don't worry. Uncle Charlie will be coming on. Uncle Charlie will be coming on. Don't worry, you're not gonna hear me ranting again for another hour. <laughs> uh, who's on, who's on? Uncle Charlie is en route home. So he should be jumping on any moment. Hope you guys having a wonderful week. How's everybody doing? Reina, who else? Nani, Jane, how you guys? Oh, let me get comfortable here. Water tonight, no more coffee for me. As you all know, Uncle Charlie is working. He's the new uh, security manager at the airport or Allied Industries or whatever that company is called. So he's, uh, he's a busy guy, as you can imagine, with the airports being smashed. Yeah, happy Aloha Friday, Tony. Hope you guys had a great week. Heading into the weekend, it's hot and muggy here. Thanks, Patty. I like this shirt, one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, I wanna keep in, uh, in check with the Aloha Friday theme. So anyway, we're going to talk story tonight. We're going to have some fun. Uh, once Uncle Charlie gets on, we got some things we want to discuss tonight. I know a lot of you guys have been paying attention to what's going on. Remember we talked the other night about how they keep moving the goal posts uh, or the goal posts and, or the goal line. And, and we saw a lot of that today as well. But um, the good news is Kauai had zero cases today. Zero cases. Uh, that is a good sign after we had seven yesterday and I think eight the day before. What's up, Melissa? Jody, how are you guys doing? So that is good news. I, I don't know um, how much testing we're doing. I think we, I think those numbers all came out of clusters. Although yesterday's seven, two were community spread, five was travel related. It was residents that flew off to the mainland and came home. Thanks, Raleen. Um, and tested positive. Not sure the circumstances, if they were sick. I do know that now um, uh, two more of my good friends tested positive. So, uh, you know, that, that's uh, kind of alarming, kind of alarming as, as we see the numbers rise. Again, today we had zero, which is a good thing. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, we have one hospitalized. But my fear and my concern is as we move into the safe travels or unsafe travels, whatever you want to call it, and, and the uh, easing of restrictions. Those of you on Oahu, I pray for you folks because uh, it's, it's pretty much opening up 100% capacity, uh, no social distancing. Um, incredible. What's up, Richard? Yeah, stay safe, my friend. If you're traveling, stay safe. The, the, the country is blowing up with cases. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news tonight, but many, many of the, uh, many of the um, states on the mainland, most of them with low vaccination rates, but nonetheless, you know, we know one thing, that the vast majority of people getting sick are not vaccinated. All of my friends that tested positive were not vaccinated. And um, it, it is frustrating and I have chatted with them but you know, it is what it is. So we know that the vaccines are working. Uh, Kiala says 18 states. Yeah, when I, I think when I saw the news earlier it was 17, but say 18 states are just blowing up. LA, which is a very big concern of mine, 128% increase in cases. And it's growing exponentially because uh, you know, LA is, is an area that a lot of people go to. now. A lot of our direct flights to Hawaii are coming from LA. So I'll wait till Uncle Charlie gets on and we can chat a little bit about the airport process. But I, I know for a fact, and I haven't really spoken to Charlie about what's going on here on Kauai, <clears throat> but we know that it's a mess. We know that the, the, the whole system is set up based on the honor system. Not, not, nothing is being validated. In fact, and again, I'll wait till Charlie comes on because I really want to get his take on this, but there were some announcements today that was disturbing. And I'm sure some of you um, may, may, be, may be aware of what I'm talking about, but a couple of the changes in the rules today, which to me, I think uh, is crazy. The governor is set on 70%. 
I think that is the, the wise thing to do. I know that um, the Lieutenant Governor was on the news tonight again, publicly urging, th this is where I disagree with his tactics. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's politically motivated rather than medically or professionally motivated. It's purely political because we know the governor's position. He's made it very clear. We know that we know the governor's position. In fact, we knew the governor's position when it was at 60% to uh, open up the, the passport, the vaccine passport program. We, we know that, but because the Lieutenant governor came out and got the public to put pressure, the, the governor gave in and we're at 58% and, and now we have the safe travels uh, program exempting vaccinated or people with the vaccine card. Purely, purely, purely honor system. So now um, the Lieutenant Governor now is publicly uh, urging the governor to remove the mask mandates from inside indoors. Uh, you know, we'll see what Ige does. We'll see if Ige will, will stay, stay on, the, uh, on the track of safety. In fact, uh, I saw some, uh, some experts testimonies today watching various different programs, and listening to several podcasts, that in fact, the recommendation is to, if you are a state that wants to uh, re reduce or ease up on restrictions, do it in small steps and monitor. So you do a little change, monitor. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor is trying to move too fast, I think. And we're not, you know, we just, the variant just showed up here. We just opened up the vaccine, uh, uh, whatever you call that, the vaccine passport program. So we'll see what happens. Nani says, Dr. Char says, we can reach 70% in three weeks. I'm not sure what she's drinking, but that I don't think that's even mathematically uh, possible. I really don't. So we'll see, we'll see. Again, I'm dying. I have not spoken to Charlie. <laughs> no, I, uh, Dad, I'm not, oh, I mean, Charlie's gonna come on. He worked late, he's driving home. He should be pumping on any moment now. Um, poor guy, he's working his okole off at the airport. So yeah, I cannot wait to get his perspective on some of this. Um, so with, with the Lieutenant Governor urging, publicly urging, I mean, it's obviously clear, right, that he doesn't agree with the governor. And it's pretty clear that the governor doesn't agree with him. But when you come out publicly as the Lieutenant Governor, then you, you mobilize people, you, you get people to, to jump in and start applying pressure uh, based on the comments and the phone calls and the emails that the governor is getting. I just hope he stays his course because look at the United States of America at the continent, in the continent. Look at the cases blowing up. We know for a fact that we were typically four to six weeks behind what was happening in the mainland. And we are just into this new variant for a couple of weeks. We just started the new protocol with the travel program, with the passports. Uh, it's too soon. We don't know. We simply do not know. But they are all, all I mean, full steam ahead. Now, Oahu, Oahu is uh, opening up. Um, no capacity limits in restaurants. We know where the clusters are happening, and yet they came out with a report uh, today saying, oh, the clusters are from, uh, what was it, gatherings, local gatherings. Of course, yeah, they're always going to blame the local gatherings. Never mind your restaurants and your uh, places of worship are, are generating clusters. No, we focus on the local gatherings. Yeah, the family gatherings, the, the ohana that is getting together for 4th of July, whatever. No, we're going to blame them. We're going to make them the bad guys. Because we don't want to do anything that's going to upset tourism. We don't want to get anybody uh, inconvenience any tourism. In fact, it's so incredible. I watched today. Uh, I watch, yeah, kimchi restaurant owner, our friend, uh, Mr. Chun, he was on our show giving away food. He passed away today unexpectedly. So yeah, condolences go out to his family. And, 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 and man, man, that's a shocker. When I heard about that, it was like, I know, I don't know if Charlie knows, and that's his good friend. So uh, we'll, we'll find out if he knows or not. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, but we, it always comes back to the local gatherings. And when, when you're faced with these clusters, when you know what's happening, and, and they're always going to go again. And I hate you say, that's why we, we, we got to slow down the show, because we keep saying the same things over and over and over and over. 
But we know that the hospitals are, are, are getting filled and maybe not with COVID, but COVID is going to create a, a very big disaster uh, if we should get more spikes. I don't think we can avoid the spikes. I'm hoping that we get enough people vaccinated that the illness will be limited, the severe illness, uh, the hospitalizations. But what we're seeing on the mainland, hospitalizations are up uh, 7% and illnesses are up by much, much more. So, you know, it's inevitable, I think. I think it's inevitable. So, you know, it's sad because the Lieutenant Governor, obviously we all know he's running for governor, we know that. So what he's doing now is he's, he's um, trying to, uh, I guess, I hate to use the word pander, but that's really what it is because he knows that the people are tired of COVID. He knows that the people are frustrated and he knows that people want to go out and he knows that people don't want to wear masks. Yeah, not, I don't want to do any of that. I, I, I want to be back to normal too. Um, I also want to be able to see my kids again. I, I want to make sure my mother-in-law is not, doesn't get sick. And there's a lot of things, the reasons why I do what I do is because not for me, but for others. And I think most of us feel that way. But when you come out and make those messages, you send out those messages that, uh, you know, now we want to, uh, remove the mask mandate indoors. We know that this virus spreads even, even uh, quicker indoors. We know that. I mean, that's not, that's not a, up for debate that we know that. We know that the masks uh, do a very good job with, with uh, slowing down the spread of the virus. We know that, that's the truth. So why would you come out and, and, and publicly, right? Publicly, knowing where your governor's at in this, except if you wanna impress voters. And that is where I think, I think, you know, when you're in a pandemic or any type of crisis, I think the politics has got to be put on a side and you focus on the issue at hand, which is the health and safety of our people. That, that's where it should be. That's where many states are. Yeah, we have a lot of states that have opened up full blast and now they're, now they're, they're, they're seeing or paying the consequences because now they're getting a lot of people sick and dying. Uh, and it's going to happen with this virus. Now we've got the Lambda virus. We've got the Lambda virus. And uh, that one's coming out of Peru, I believe. South America, and, and uh, we don't even know what that'll do. Initial, initial studies are showing that it should be, uh, the, the, the vaccinations should be able to, to tone it down, but we don't know that. We haven't had it here yet, but it's gonna come. We know it's gonna come. So, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, my concern is that we, we keep moving. Every day you get up, it's like, uh, and we'll talk, once Charlie gets on, we'll talk about the changes in the rules that was announced today. And I, I really want to get his take on it now that he's working at the airport. But everything, every decision, if you think about this, every single decision that is being made as it relates to COVID is geared towards tourism. It's so funny because everyone, everyone is mentioning about how uh, we got to manage tourism and how we got to control tourism. But yet actions speak louder than words. Every single thing that comes out of the lips of these politicians and, and, and decision makers are changes that will make it more convenient for the visitor, for the visitor. We're not talking about how we, you know, we took very little discussion and very general broad discussions on, on how we control tourism because it's not gonna happen. They don't want that to happen. They don't. See, right now, the industry, the HTA, in fact, when we talked about the, the capacities, you know, Mufi was on the news last night and he was talking about that, uh, you know, we got to really open up and, and, and keeping everything at 75% is, is creating problems. And I mean, you remember when they were at 25% and they were begging to get to set, you know, you give a guy an inch, they want a mile. That, that's kind of how it's working right now. Yeah, they got what they wanted, now they want more. And yet, yet now is not the time. Our cases haven't gone down. Our deaths are still, people still dying. We have... Cases haven't gone. You would think with all the protocols in place that the numbers would be very low. No, it's still in the 70s, 80s. It was still there. It hasn't really impacted. Granted, the vaccinated people aren't getting sick, but we still have about half of our people that aren't vaccinated. So, I mean, it's, it's a scary thing and it's, it's not gonna get any better. Um, let me see. Sorry, my, my thing hasn't scrolled. I said way behind on my comments. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Uncle Charlie's coming on. I know, guys. I know you guys must be sick and tired. 
of uh, of seeing myself on, on this thing, but um, I sorry, you know, he got to work. <laughs> so so bottom line is this, guys. We every decision that is being made is being made to for the, in the for the benefit of tourism and the visitor industry. And and uh, and it's and it's really putting the, our our visitors, our, I mean our residents, at risk. And that is what bothers me the most. That's what bothers me the most. And um, and I don't think that's going to change. I, I'm dying to see if Ige will will cave in and um, and and open up and lift the restrictions before 70. percent I think that's going to be a huge mistake. It's going to be a huge mistake. I mean, look at look at Hana Maui. Uh, they, I mean, the locals can't even get to Hana without dealing with traffic, without dealing with tourists parking on the road where they're not supposed to park. You know. Not much said about that except, oh, you know, oh, my goodness, you know, we got to be patient or, you know, there's not much we can do. No, you can't. You tow those guys. You tow the car, right? Or put those, the, the boots on them so they cannot leave and they pay. They pay you a lot to get the boot removed. That's how you fix it. But no, you don't want to inconvenience the tourists. I am positive. That if the scenario was changed and it was local cars parked along that road, many more citations would be issued, many more vehicles would be towed. But because it's tourists, we don't want to inconvenience the tourists. We don't want to give Hawaii a bad name. We want them to come back. Of course we do, but that's not managing tourism. That is not managing tourism. So that's that's where we're at today, guys. That's where we're at. And I don't see that changing. I think every every day these guys go on uh, when they meet, they figure out how you know how they'll hear the complaints from the industry. They they will hear it from Mufi and from everybody else, and and then they will adjust. They will adjust to uh, the industry. That's just what's been happening, and it's not going to change. They are at a point right now that they're going to get as much as they can squeeze out of tourism while this, the boom is happening. That, that's, I think, their mentality. They think, yeah, we'll get, we'll get through this surge, take all the money we can, and then we'll focus on managing afterwards. I, I think that's what's happening. The problem is this surge isn't gonna stop because people, we've got a lot of people that wanna come here. Those planes are full. Those planes are full. So we shall see what happens as the days progress. We're gonna see what happens. I, I think the weekend will be quiet, but next week, I, I would guess that, uh, you know, we'll hear more announcements, but let me just, uh, I'll, I'll share with you, because I don't know where Charlie's at, but I'll, I'll share with you uh, a couple of the things that I heard today. Number one was, this one's kind of scary. Pfizer came out today and said, hey, they're seeking emergency, uh, 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 emergency use or whatever, whatever that thing is called, emergency use permission or whatever, to get a third shot, a booster, because their studies out of Israel are showing that the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, starting to lose its effectiveness after six months. Now, some may say that's just Pfizer wanting to make more money, whatever. That's what they said. That's what their studies out of Israel is showing. And we know what's going on in Israel. It's not good. Now, our country said, no, nah, no, nah, we don't have proof of that. We don't agree. We don't think anybody should even think about getting a third shot, which is so bizarre because up until today, they, the talk was we may have to get a third shot. Yeah, we're waiting for studies. We're waiting for evidence. And once we, what we may end up having, which we more than likely will be able, will we have to get a, a booster to take care of the mm -hmm. variants. And today, Pfizer came out and said, we're seeing in Israel that after about six months, the efficiency or effectiveness starts to wane. Oh, here comes Charlie. All right. Whoo, I was getting worried. I was getting worried. What up, Charlie? Oh, he's connecting to audio. Yep. What's up? What's up? Can't hear you, bro. Cannot hear me? I can't hear you. You sure? You're either pulling my leg or you're not. That's yours, cause my 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 mic is. Can you guys hear Charlie? Can you guys hear Charlie? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, yeah. let me see.
Can anybody hear Charlie? Look at all the hearts you're getting, Charlie. Boy, I'm hurt. My ego has been busted. <laughs> uh, we can hear you, Charlie. Okay, Charlie, they can hear you. You cannot hear me at all. I can hear you. Hang on. Why can't they hear you? Why can't I hear you? No. Try again, Charlie. Testing one, two, one, two, one, two. I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Welcome back, Charlie. Glad to be back. Glad to be back. Boy, I was already sweating. I was looking at the clock saying, oh, no, I cannot do this again. <laughs> I got water. I mean, I think, Charlie, the last one, I kind of vented too much, and um, I was drinking coffee, so tonight I'm back to water. Good boy. Good boy. How you doing, brother? How you I'm doing? I'm all right, man. We're just getting into the discussion um, about, uh, we didn't start really anything because I wanted to make sure you were here, but I did want to talk about, I told everybody we're going to have fun tonight, but I did want to get some things out of the way. And the first thing that we brought up right now before you came in was the Pfizer. Pfizer is coming out now and saying, hey, we're reviewing the, the reports coming out of Israel and we, we're seeing that the efficiency, effectiveness of this vaccine is waning it's it's lessening after six months so they're they're coming up to get an emergency use permit or whatever it's called uh for a third shot a booster and the gov federal government is saying no you we don't need that <laughs> <laughs> you say no we don't need that no we don't have the we don't have the evidence hey dummies pfizer just gave you the evidence the studies out of israel now what's weird is not long ago, everyone from the CDC and the WHO and all of these world, all these people was, was talking about the Israel information and how bad we got to get vaccinated because mm -hmm. this is what we're seeing in Israel. Now, when Israel studies go against what they want, all of a sudden they say, nah, there's no proof. We only use the Israel information when it fits our mode, our model, our agenda. But the bottom line is this, the, fa the manufacturer of the Pfizer vaccine is saying, after six months, the effectiveness starts to re get reduced. We should get a third shot, which is what everyone expected, right, Charlie, from, from when they started this vaccine thing. Everyone was pretty sure that we would have to get a booster. Now yep. Pfizer says we need the booster, and our beautiful government is saying, no, listen to Pfizer. You don't need to. <laughs> I'm dying to hear your thoughts, Charlie. Well, first, Israel was the leaders, right? They were the leaders and they had the most vaccine po by population, right? Yep. Nearly 90% of their population got vaccinated, plain and simple. So to hear that, that's why a lot of scientists around the world was watching how people would start to react to the, to the virus because they had... They had a larger number. They had, it's, it's like a canvas and a painting. If you got a canvas stretched to the max and you've got all the paint readily available, artists wants to see what colors are gonna come up on that canvas. And so was Israel. They wanted to take a look and see how it would react in a real world, real time situation. Not a um, experimental situation, but everyday life. And Lo and behold, numbers of infections started to happen. But, you know, it wasn't new to us that uh, whatever happens, it's supposed to lessen the load. But nevertheless, whether it's lessened to make it less severe or not, I'm of the opinion, I don't want the damn thing at all. <laughs> right? I don't care if it's lessened because I still will feel some misery I'm not going to be 100%. It's still miserable. So if you have an underlying condition, it could affect that, right? So, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. And so now, with everything that's happening around us, one has to ask yourself, uh, and, you know, where I work at, ooh, there was a lot of people. They were all wearing the mask. But some of the hygiene wasn't the greatest. You know, I see them touching things. Me, wherever I have my little bottle of uh, sanitizer, I'm sanitizing. These people, they, 
I don't know where they come from, but I give them a couple of alohas and whoop, I'm going the opposite direction. I don't like them shake my hand. I don't like them say, come, how are you, brother? Aloha. No, 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 no. We just got to be careful. Well, we'll see what, what comes off out of this. I mean, I think, you know, again, from the beginning, even with Dr. Uh, Jerome Kim, the uh, director general from the International Vaccine Institute, talked about uh, that more than likely we would need a, a booster. So I'm not sure what this country is doing. I don't, I mean, think about this, right? If in fact the efficiency wasn't dropping, right, and we got more people getting vaccinated, but the numbers of cases are, are staying the same, or in some cases even increasing, what does that tell you? What is that telling you that the virus is still around and it's still not, has not gone away? And yeah. uh, for the, I think for the government to come out and, and come out and say, basically tell, telling you, do not pay attention to what Pfizer is saying. That's how I took it anyway. Uh, I think it's kind of uh, irresponsible. I think, in fact, we should be, we should be taking a look at the booster as they were telling us all along that we, we, we might need. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes again, Charlie. You always talk about how come we're still getting cases? Mm -hmm. uh, how come we're still getting cases? Everything was working so well, we'd be at zero or one or two. Um, and we're still seeing cases uh, throughout the state. So, and granted, you know, a lot of people are, are getting very mild illness or some not even getting any symptoms. The problem is, is the ones that are getting sick, the ones that are in the hospital and the ones that are on ventilators and the ones that are dying. Um, what, what part don't they understand? So, well, well, that... Charlie, you, you, you brought up the airport. So I wanted to kind of go in. I want to get your take on a couple of things today that was mentioned, the changes. <clears throat> the first one, well, we talked a little bit before you came on tonight about uh, Honolulu is basically opening up. No, no capacity, no social distancing required. The Lieutenant Governor is, is urging, publicly urging the governor on the news publicly, basically putting the pressure on the governor to remove the mask mandate for indoors uh, for vaccinated people. Not, you know, again, how you know who's vaccinated or not, I don't know. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that before we get into the changes that are happening with the Safe Travels program. But what, what are your thoughts, Charlie? Well, I'm pretty sure there's many of us that by nature now, it's, it's like second nature. Uh, as soon as I get out of the car, it, you don't have to be reminded, oh, gotta put them on mask. It's just, you reach for it or you have it in your pocket and you put it on, plain and simple. But I think the Lieutenant Governor is playing with a very, very dangerous uh, approach to things because I'm just wondering if somebody does get sick It'll probably be a weak argument, but can they make the argument that, hey, I follow what the Lieutenant Governor said and he lied. So if you're gonna go after the Lieutenant Governor for making that statement and you got sick and say you survive it, the best thing for you to do, probably nothing can come about it. But if you're a resident of Hawaii, just remember 2022, that's your answer. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see what the governor does. Uh, you know, the, the lieutenant governor was successful in getting the governor to bend on the 60%. You remember, the governor said 60% will allow the Trans Pacific to come in with the vaccination cards. And uh, he, he, he let it go before that because of the pressure that was put on, constant pressure every morning on the news from the lieutenant governor, which I really think is unfair. Uh, I wish they would give the governor the same amount of time to tell the people why he's not opening it up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's incredible how the media has, and, and granted, Josh Green, you know, he's open to that. He, of course, right? He's running for, for governor. So he's going to take every opportunity to get in front of the cameras. But we, we need the governor to come out. And he's, he said it in a, in a few interviews that he has done. He's made it very clear that he's relying on the, on the science and he's lying, relying on the Department of Health input before he makes any decisions and he's right now is not interested in lifting the restrictions until we get to 70 percent so i applaud the governor for that and i hope he will stay the course because i think opening up all restrictions or uh, that's 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 crazy 
That's suicide, man. That's crazy. So the, the state came out today, Charlie, and you, you know this because you work at the airport. Up until today, all of the vaccination cards had to be your CDC card. There were two changes. Yep. Today, because of the backlog, again, right, because everything is done with the, with the convenience of the visitor in mind. So the state came out today and said, you know what, we, we, too many people coming in with non-CDC cards, so we're going we're gonna to allow all cards, vaccination cards, even if it's not on a CDC card. Well, check your vaccination card. You get the little CDC logo and all of that. Okay, remember the Lieutenant Governor said, nobody going to uh, uh, fake that because it's a federal violation. So now today the state came out and said, hey, we, any card, any vaccination card from any facility, as long as you have the lot number, as long as you have the lot number. And the other change, Charlie, and I want, I want to get your take on both of these changes. The other change was the even more stupid change was that up until today, you had to have the physical card with you. Mm -hmm. You had to have the physical card. Well, because a lot of people apparently didn't have the physical card, rather than say, sorry, you're going to quarantine. No, we're taking digital copies now. So if you have a card back home and you took a picture of it and you show it on your phone, that's gonna be sufficient today. They made those changes because the lines were moving too slow. The visitors were getting agitated. So we came out with two new changes. Number one, it doesn't have to be a CDC card now. You could freaking have your fifth grade student write one up. Number two, you don't even have to have the physical card as long as you have a digital copy, meaning you took a picture of it. Right. Unbelievable, Charlie. Just your thoughts because you were there on the front lines during the day. Well, I will say... I think Kauai is probably the second busiest airport in the state by far. I mean, it is a madhouse. Uh, everyone loves Kauai, but I can see where there's a lot of shortfalls, okay? Uh, hats off to the gang from Roberts. They're the ones that's checking everything, right? They come down, they shoot, they come on either lanes, either checkpoints coming out. And you got the people from Roberts checking everything. My only fear is what I didn't see anything that would tell me there is something. I mean, there there is something. I, I think they're looking at something. Because, you know, sometimes when all fails, right, we stand there and we look important. <laughs> Even though we don't know what we're doing, but just, hey, just stand there and look important. Now, that's not to say that they don't know what they're doing. They, they know what they're doing. But all the state did was just make it harder to really do an effective program. You know, if you're going to do that, then why don't you just say, you know what, gang? There's no more virus. We're going to open up. Say that. But for some reason, they're not saying that. Okay? That's one. Two, if they're going to take a digital uh, I guess replica of your, of your original card, you know how many times people have Photoshopped it? And once they upload it, I mean, you use that. I mean, unless you, if you're really good forensic experts, and I don't think a lot of these lines have anyone that's remotely close to a forensic expert in handwriting analysis or vaccine analysis, or even the, or even knowing what type of uh, tape they use with that printed the lot number that is stuck on the card. Because some people remember now in the inception of this program, some of it was handwritten. It wasn't on those labels. So nobody said anything of what's accepted and what's not accepted. That's how you know when a program is faulted, okay? Look what they did to us with your driver's license. They said that you had to have the gold star by a certain date, the gold star. Well, at least they standardize it, right? Whether you're on license from Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington State, 
Oregon State, you have to have the gold star. Okay? It's not every state for themselves. There's, there still needs some things that needs to be standardized. And there it is. That's a digital copy. All I gotta do is print this. Yes. Write my write my name. Yes. Put my wife's lot number or any lot number. I'm sure the airport guys don't know what the heck a lot number. How would you validate that? Well, we have four initials on the healthcare professional clinic side. Put pick any four initials you want. L A P D or whatever. Uh, put in the date and then you take a picture of it. Keep it in your phone and you come through the gate. Your name is going to match your ID. Date of birth, all of that is going to be accurate because you filled it out. You write in the first dose. And if you're smart, you just do one and you put your J&J uh, &J, and you're done. And you come right through the airport line. That's how simple. I should have done one today just to show you guys we put all my info. But I think this is, this is, I just pulled this right now off of the internet, right now, as Charlie was talking. That is spooky. Honor system, <laughs> honor system. So. Yep. But you know, you know the sad thing about it? We have high influx of people, right? I'm kind of diverting off the subject here, but I still see a lot of people standing in line because you just can't get in. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people walking around the parking lot, walking around aimlessly. Why? They're looking for their two-year-old cars. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of funny to see because, you know, on Kauai, we don't have the greatest parking lot. And I can just imagine they give you directions. Okay, you go by this crosswalk. You go halfway up, make a left. Blah, 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 blah. And the tires will be, I mean, and the keys will be in the car. Well, if we know that, because there's, there's nobody that comes by and greets you and puts out the contract. No, they tell you where the car is. So sooner or later, somebody will catch on and somebody will be driving off with those cars. And they're not the ones who are supposed to have the cars. That's what's going to happen. So... But it's just one of those things. It's one yeah. of those things. So we shall see how all that pans out, man. Um, you know, I'm, I'm ex extremely concerned and we won't see the effects of it for another week or so, maybe two weeks possibly, uh, as more yeah. and more of these guys come in and start freely running around, no test. I mean, that's kind of incredible. Uh, we saw, you know, we talked about before you came on, Charlie, how Kauai had zero cases today. But yesterday, we had seven, five of which were travel-related from residents coming back from the mainland. And it's telling me that this virus is, is and I'm, I'm not going to speculate because they could have gone anywhere. I don't know where they went on the mainland. But we know there are certain areas, LA, Vegas, uh, and, and some of the Midwest and, and towards the East Coast. There's many states that are blowing up, but we know for a fact LA is in Vegas. Uh, some lady chewed me out the other day because I... I and nothing bad about Vegas. I, I love Vegas, but what I said was that what's happening in Vegas right now with the spikes should be a clue or a hint for our decision makers. That, that's what I meant. I, there's nothing negative towards Vegas. But she, she took it personal because she lives there and she went off and blasted me for several posts, whatever. It doesn't bother me anymore. My point is that when we see what's happening in those places, and we know that the majority of the passengers coming in directly from the mainland are coming from LA or coming from Vegas. We need to be careful. We, we should be cognizant, we should be aware, and we shouldn't be easing up restrictions until we know for a fact that our processes are working. And from what we're seeing, it's not. So don't get, don't get it mixed up. I'm not saying that we, we know the vaccine is working, but that's what they're, they're only using that as, as, you know, they're only using the fact that if you're vaccinated, you're not going to get sick. So what? So let's open up. And for those of you that don't get vaccinated, that's your kuleana. Well, you know, it's all of our kuleana. And the job of the state is to protect all of us, not just the vaccinated ones. And that's where I, I think I, 
I have a little conflict with the lieutenant governor and even the governor. Well, again, you just got to be safe. You know, there's, um, I first want to thank all of you who had concerns because I'm, I'm down in ground zero. But you know what? Where my office is located, I'm, I'm perfectly safe. And even if I walk into baggage claim, I'm always avoiding people. I make that extra effort to not walk into the cluster of people. I walk around. Even if it costs me a little bit more time getting from baggage claim A down there, and that's on the uh, south side of the concourse, all the way to baggage claim B, which is the north side. I can tell you, it's been, it, it's been a fun experience so far, and I enjoy it. And I'm just exercising a lot, walking around, you know, getting to spread the aloha. But you, you learn to start avoiding people. You, and, and you don't even have to look up when you're walking. You can almost sense when people are around and you just, you just take another route. And that's what you got to do for a while. You got to do that. You want to stay safe. You want to stay safe. Dr. Miskovic just came on said the May 13th decision to announce that masks are no longer needed if you've been vaccinated will cost tens of thousands of Americans to lose their lives. I've been all over the country since that decision and no one wears masks, even though the stats in the regions I've been to are 35, 35 to 50%. Bars and restaurants are jammed. People are lined up and no one respects social distancing. It's exactly what's happening, Doc. Thank you for chiming in. Yeah, we know. Uh, I think for those of us that actually follow this and not just listen to the garbage in the morning news, I think for most of us, we understand what's going on because we pay attention to what's going on around the country. And of course, not to the level that you are, Doc, because you're out there in those areas. But for, for us that rely on, on the media and the coverages and the press conferences from other countries, I mean, uh, other states and from podcasts, I'm starting to listen to some really, really good power, uh, podcasts. I, I think there is reason to be concerned. And I think for the Lieutenant Governor to start pushing no mask ma mandates for inside, in, indoors, I think is, is scary. And I don't know, Doc, I don't know if you wanna chime in on that, but I think to remove the mask mandate for, for indoors, I know there's talk about the, the kids in school that they don't have to wear masks and they don't have to, social distance. Now, I don't think that the state is going to make that change from what I heard tonight in the news, but that's what the feds are saying. That's what the feds are, are recommending. They're moving this thing along. It was, and I'm not going to get political in this, but you know, the last administration got hammered because they were pushing to open up, open up, open up. And this, this administration is no different. And now we got variants. Guys, we got to take this seriously and got to be safe. And I don't see the hassle of wearing a mask if it's going to protect people you love. That's where I struggle. It's not asking you to go get a shot every day or every week or every month. It's asking you to wear a mask to protect others. That's what bothers me. And I, I don't know, Doc Miskovich, maybe you can chime in on that. What are your thoughts about the Lieutenant Governor's recommendation now urging the governor to remove the mask mandate for indoors if you have a if you have a vaccine if you're vaccinated the question who is vaccinated and who's not <laughs> so doc if you don't mind i'd love to hear your thoughts hey that text them text them uh let's see if he wants to come on right now and let's put him in front of the camera i can't i don't saying. know doc you want to come on doc hang on doc I told you guys it was going to be fun tonight. I told you guys. Hey, before we go on, a um, bit of a sad news today. I want to, you know, some of you saw the show when we brought on my good friend, uh, Jimmy Chun from Kimchi 2 on the island of Oahu. Well, unfortunately, he passed away last night from a heart attack uh, en route to the hospital. Terrible news, terrible news. Yeah, and it was, uh, it affected a lot of us. Called a good friend whose father just came out of a successful surgery at Kaiser. And he too was a good friend of Jimmy and, and he couldn't believe it. 
and called a brother of mine who we all spent countless hours together back in the day. And we were reminiscing about Jimmy. He was always a fun loving guy, big Korean. I mean, I swear he was, he was a Korean version of the Sasquatch Bigfoot. He was big, not, not Momona big, but tall. And he was very wide and, uh, and you know, I, uh, I don't know his age. I believe he's, he's, he's younger than us. He's in his fifties and he passed away. So my condolences goes out to his, uh, his family and his children. And, you know, kimchi too. I, I know the children's been working at the restaurant. So I know they'll, they'll, and it started off with his father. That man was a fixture in that restaurant. He always sat behind that cash register. And um, you know, when he passed away, then Jimmy took over at the helm. Jimmy assumed that role, but Jimmy was always on the move. He would be the one actually coming out from behind the register, walking up to the tables, talking stories, see how everything was done, passing out the, their famous uh, uh, seaweed soup and the daikong, kimchi daikong, and you know, continually just feeding, in fact, they would feed you up before the main dish would come. And uh, now that's going to be no more. But, you know, I think his memory will live on with his, in his kids because they, they're just like their dad. He had a good soul. I remember now when COVID hit, he was on the verge of closing down. But what did he do? He took whatever profits he had, made food for those who couldn't afford at the time, and fed people. Whether they were okay or whether they didn't have money. It didn't matter to him. He just said, hey, he just fed people. And Soto was like my dad. My dad was that tight. He used to always tell my mom, honey, no grumble about food. If we get too much and we can give somebody else fine, but no grumble about food because everybody got to eat, okay? And that's how my father was and that's how Jimmy was. No grumble about the food, just eat. Until you, until you had your fill. So, you know, we say aloha and goodbye to a good brother. And that's, uh, I think that's the hard part. Whew. Hang on, I just, I'm sending um, Dr. Miskovich the link. He'll be coming on. He'll be coming on. Yeah, you know, that guy, well, well a lot of people were struggling and, and, and um, you know, just so concerned about COVID and the lockdowns, this guy was able to continue working and feeding the needy. And I mean, what an angel, I, you know, I've never met him. We, he was on our show, Charlie, thanks to you. And, and I got to meet him that way and was just so impressed with his heart, uh, his personality. I was shocked today when I heard that he had passed away. Man, just sad, sad, sad. So guys, you know, that's, that's it, man. Life is short. Life is short and you never know. Uh, you never know what tomorrow brings. So you gotta live it. Yeah. You gotta live it. So anyway, but, Charlie, uh, on on uh whatever day it was, I guess it was what is today? It was on Wednesday, I guess. Wednesday I, I shared with, with everyone that we were gonna kind of wind down, that in fact we felt that our job had been done. We had pretty much did everything that we could as far as COVID, and as we can see, uh the train is running, the chain the train is moving, and uh, now we sit back and we watch so that we would, you know, we would continue to show, of course, we would slowly do the transition into issues and topics that affect the state, uh, whether it's COVID or other things, and, and that we would be, uh, you know, going down to one night a week. Subject to change, subject, subject to change, if issues come up, topics come up, we'll, we'll always uh, jump on, but we kind of mm -hmm. wanted to keep the content engaging and not just ramble every night about the same thing over and over and over. So um, yep. I did share that Wednesday, Charlie. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I know that uh, I think when we head off into our new venture, I, I, I do want to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. And that's uh, ingrown toenails and uh, toe jams. We're, we're going to talk a lot about that in the coming days. We'll do that on the uh, next week. We have uh, 
guys, next week we will have, Tuesday, we'll have Dr. Dworkin, infectious disease specialist, uh, actually a real expert. And um, he'll be on talking about a bunch of things, including a book that he, he wrote that's being published right now. And uh, he's gonna share with, with us his book, but he's also gonna talk about what's going on with this virus and variants. Tuesday, seven o'clock, make sure you guys be here. And then maybe if we have time, Charlie, we'll talk about the ingrown toenails and the, and the toe jams. I think we, we might have enough time. In fact, he would be a great asset or a resource to ask about that. Yep. Because I know, uh, I mean, I've seen it down at the airport, you know, people walking with slippers and I hear these scraping on the, on the, the pavement. And I said, hey, maybe you're going to step on a nail or something, you know, was down and Oh, shit. I sent him, sorry, I sent him the wrong link. Huh? I sent him the wrong link. The missing link. <laughs> I sent him the wrong link. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so anyway, um, <laughs> so I, 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 I hear, you know, the sound following me behind like, I looked behind, I said, wow, what was that? And lo and behold, there's this person with ingrown toenails, look like one side claw. What was the, digging up the asphalt? And just... <laughs> I sorry, I bet, you know, when you, when you do the 40, 15 hour a day, <laughs> you just go nuts. But yes, Morel, I will stop. Not. <laughs> I will keep on going. I so sorry, guys. I sent uh, Dr. Miskovich the wrong Zoom link, so he should be. I just sent him the right one. Oh my God! See, that's why yeah. we can only go one day a week. Look at what Charlie's talking about. <laughs> Nani says uh, you're yeah. delirious. Yeah, pretty damn close. <laughs> no, it's um, we sent Dr. Um, Miskovich the link to the uh, the knitting class that we had. Yeah, remember that knitting class? Yeah. The what class? The knitting class, how to oh, knit. knitting, yeah, yeah. You know, I was so happy. I was, I was doing on sleeve, and you know, if if you don't hold back when you make the sleeve, the whole sleeve gonna end up like a really big, like on pants. So, there uh, he, he, look, he had to go put on that shirt. He had to go. That's why he was. He had to go put on the Team USA shirt, the Olympic COVID. Oh no, 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 no! That that's not Team USA. That's yeah. from South Pacific. That's Team USA. That's no, team. no. <laughs> no fair. This is my uh, Team USA swimming Olympic shirt. Yeah, no, this is this is a real deal. I didn't have to go put it on. Actually, I was wearing it. And my wife said, are you going to wear that shirt? And I'm like, I, yeah, come on, man. i got to support the colors here. Absolutely. Our, uh, hey, a lot of friends I know get that Team USA swimming shirt too, but they only wear them on land because they don't know how to swim, but they're like, they're proud of the swim team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, um, they're leaving the 12th, you know, so we're, we're still uh, testing, we're still testing them now. And I can proudly say that we have uh, not had a single Olympian being eliminated due to COVID and um, you know, and that's in all of the main events that we've been testing, you know, we did track and field gymnastics and swimming and uh, rugby um, you know, which are the big, bigger team sports and not a soul because of the protocols, which is kind of interesting, you know, that we're, that, that, that I'm telling you that because then I, I read today those CDC guidelines and, you know, kind of makes me, uh, the school guidelines, and it makes me cringe a little bit uh, because I was dealing, I've been dealing with the, um, the, the, the um, Wendell Lock and the uh, ILH and trying to help them with their guidelines for schools and geez, our CDC is really going to hurt our country. They've hurt our country already. And these type of loose decisions that are being made um, are, are just not the things that we need right now when we have the Delta variant. So. Well, hey, well, now, what about the, what about the ahead, booster? Charlie. You know, they're talking about it now. Pfizer booster shots because of the, the variant. What do you think? Guys, you can go back and you can check my TV history and um, 
Uh, and I've been talking about the booster from the time it's come out. The data has been solid on it. And uh, I started talking on my CNN time and other times about the Israeli study, which was really well done, uh, which is what they're quoting now. And the, the keys with the Israeli study showed that there was waning immunity, especially in the Kakuna and the people that were 70, 75 and older, they started to show waning immunity. There wasn't much problem at all in the 18 to 30 year old age groups. They were saying, showing a lot of, um, um, uh, of antibodies even more. So there's, there's zero. I've never once questioned that we will need uh, a booster and the boosters are more than likely going to be given to the at-risk people, the people probably older than 50. And the other thing that we're not talking about right now is there are numerous studies that we're working on. No one talks about the fact that if you're an organ transplant patient, you need three booster shots, and that's still only taking you up to 70, 75%. At two shots, you got barely any. So they need three total shots on three boosters. So they need a booster. And then we're working on anyone with any degree of immunosuppression, whether you've been on chronic steroids or whether you are on certain other types of medicine, you should probably be getting a booster. And a lot of doctors right now, we're not even waiting for the CDC because they're so slow and they are so, oops, sorry. <laughs> and they're so backward with um, some of the, the, the decision-making. We're recommending right now that our immunosuppressed get a booster before you even wait. And, um, and that's, you know, we all know this, the people that are living this, um, and I'm not just saying me, I'm talking about medical experts across the country and world. We all know this and we're waiting for the CDC. Uh, you know, the CDC is, uh, they better, we better look back at this process and I can send you report. I, I can send you articles, and hopefully you guys think, don't think I'm spamming you with the articles I'm starting to send you. But there's a, a lot of cry from the medical world to say it's time to relook at our CDC because uh, there's some serious, serious problems with the way they've handled COVID. So boosters, yes, everybody should be prepared for your kapuna, and if you've had any health issues or you're at risk or front line. You'll probably be needing a booster sometime, I'm guessing, in the first two quarters of 2022 or sometime, you know, next year. Uh, so, sorry. You guys. So, let me ask you, Doug, what can we expect or what can you guess that the reactions that people will have taking their booster? Because so, like like many of us that, that took this vaccine for the first time, there was, you know, there was a... a, a differing reactions right from a slight fever to soreness to some not even having anything to some being deathly ill so when a booster comes along i mean is it a concentrated form and highly compact when it's delivered or is it same shot know, same same shot same shot and um uh the the the, there's no finite data out there about the booster side effects, et cetera. We do know it's safe. Let's put it that way. We, do, we know it's safe. Um, and we're talking right now Pfizer, Pfizer and Moderna. We're not talking yet J&J. &J. There hasn't been any data out with that. Uh, and as we found with the global data on Pfizer and Moderna, about uh, upwards of 80, 85% of the people could have some degree of feeling some effect, whether it's an achiness or headache or fatigue. Some people got some more, you know, real, real film flu-like uh, day. The, the timeline was about uh, less 24 hours or less. So seldom did it go above. Now, of course, there's a, the rarities that will go above. And, um, and so the data I've read so far on the boosters are that it's not as bad and, um, you know, it's less, less problematic, uh, but there's still, it still needs to be studied more. But again, I'll take a day of feeling a little bit crummy. I got mine and I was, I was just blah. I just couldn't. Oh. Um, so yeah, I just felt a little bit blah and um, fatigued. Um, some people get achy headaches, fever. So, but now we're, 
do it, please. Anybody <laughs> listening, get a vaccine. Tell your family to get the vaccine. Tell your friends. Um, and if you do have any questions about being immunosuppressed, uh, check with your doctor to see whether you should be possibly getting a booster already. You know, that's starting to happen across the country and world. Okay. Well, Doc, you know, you, uh, from, from very early on, as well as many others that we've had on the show, doctors, experts, epidemiologists, uh, all talked about, in fact, even our government talked about the likely need to get a booster after six months or so. We didn't know back then. And now all of a sudden, uh, our federal government is telling us that, hey, you know, what I, what I saw tonight, it was clearly to really disregard what uh, Pfizer is saying about the, the booster, that uh, we don't have any evidence. Yet, you know, I saw a little bit of the Israel, uh, an article that clearly shows that we probably need to get that booster sooner than later. So uh, how does this all work? I mean, it's going to be up to the FDA to give the approval to Pfizer. And if, I mean, how much influence does CDC and everyone else have on, on the FDA to grant that emergency use permit? Mm, you're, you're exactly right. Um, th that is going to be the conundrum. And here, here's my issue. Let me pro put it, the explanation in this way right now. I have been saying that at some point, we now know, everybody's seen the data, that it's 95% effective, right? We know that the virus is 95% effective. Well, which of the 5% are not affected and do not get the immunity that we need? We don't even know that now if some of these people have less antibodies, even though you're healthy. So what the CDC is doing is, and is making a decision for a global population of our country of you know over 330 million people. Well, you know, your, your grandma or someone's kapuna or someone's auntie, they're an individual. They're not just a big global statistic. So we're gonna let a global statistic and some statisticians make a decision that could say, oh, but the 30,000 more people die because they were just part of the, the half percent we couldn't address. No, no, no eventually we're going to have to find a way, just like nowadays, if you've potentially had your MMR shot and you don't know whether you have the, the, the measles, mumps and rubella, you know, antibodies still in there, you go get a blood test. Your doctor orders a test and the test shows, yeah, you're good, you have it. Eventually that's what's going to have to happen. There's going to have to be some degree of individualization that we're going to have to know the surety that you are protected, right? I mean, I don't know why we're not talking, but there, it's all about cost and money they're talking about, but no, people are gonna end up going to their, eventually for this to be done right, we're gonna to go to our doctors and your doctor's office is going to order your MMR and your COVID titer, you know, or, or you'll just get a COVID blood test. So you'll get a little finger stick and you'll get your COVID titer eventually it's going to happen. And I'll tell you what, guys, right now, especially with how much I'm on the road, I'm dying to know how much tighter I have. I'm so freaking exposed. What about all these healthcare workers? What about our first responders? And what about all these people at the airports? You saw these crowds. I, I think they all deserve to know via blood, a blood test. And I can tell you it's 40 bucks. That's how much it costs. It's not the arm and a leg that the, the labs can do. You need a COVID antibody titer test um, uh, for the spike protein, the specific one. And it's not broadly being pushed out yet because the insurance pushes back and insurance controls healthcare. And they're like, we don't wanna pay for it. So um, that's really what we need to start the conversation on individualization of COVID immunity and not just making everybody in our country a statistic and being at the beck and call of the CDC or FDA who have failed our country already. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. We'll have to send this, this video over to CNN tonight and, um, and get them to play that segment. Um, and it, you know, the best part about that, it'll say, Source, Mel and Charlie Show. 
<laughs> Doc, let's. Uh, I just want real quick. We don't have much time left, and I appreciate you coming on without any notice. Um, but yesterday we opened up. We opened up uh, safe travel. So now vaccine, in, uh, vaccine, whatever exemption, passport exemption, whatever it's called. Today the state made an announcement that uh, <clears throat> you don't really have to bring your physical card. You can have a photo or a digital copy, which is a basically a, a digital photo. And it doesn't have to be on the CDC card. They changed those rules today because the lines were too long and the screening was taking too long. So right now, it doesn't really matter where you got your vaccine. You, there's no CDC document or you don't need a CDC document. But what troubles me the most is that a digital copy is sufficient. There's no validation. So it's really the honor system. And, and the Lieutenant Governor today urging this, the governor to remove the mask mandate for indoor use for vaccinated people, which you, you can't tell the difference between vaccinated or unvaccinated. I just kind of, in a nutshell, if you could talk to us about, your, if you have any concerns about any of these things that are happening right now in Hawaii as we, we're, our numbers are getting to pre-COVID levels as far as visitors. Um, I, I have to preface all of it with what I said on my uh, my message to you guys is the the game has changed because of the Delta variant, okay? And because of the Delta variant, I, I have to admit two months ago, I might've been like, oh, wow, we're in so good a shape if you're vaccinated and, you know, the honor system people. But once that May 13 decision came out and you saw everybody took their masks off. Remember that decision said, if you're unvaccinated, you should have your mask on. No one wears masks when you have it up to zero. So that means for me, that was the testimony of the honor system right there. And that's why I sent that text. We gave it a chance. And I'm not saying that naturally Americans are dishonest. What I'm saying is there's this there's this group shift or risky shift phenomenon of what, when you get put in a group environment, you don't want to be the, the person standing out, right? And so that is what's driving this whole process is that people don't wanna be the one standing out. They don't wanna be challenged for why I'm not vaccinated. So it's just as easy to take that mask off and just, you know, because no one checks them, no one. No, and, and let's face it, they're not vaccinated because they have some reason why they're not vaccinated. And that may be a reason why they're saying, heck, I'm not gonna wear it anyways. I shouldn't have had to do it in the first place, which is the attitude, you know, me traveling around the South. Oh, geez, you know, you see arguments, you see, oh, it's, there's, there's just a strong sediment that, uh, sediment that COVID doesn't work. So I think that there's data with the Delta variant coming out of, um, I think I said this maybe on the last time I was with you guys, out of the UK, they took the 90, 92,000 people they've studied with the Delta uh, variant that were positive. Uh, 8,000 of those people were vaccinated. Do that percentage. That's a fairly significant percent of individuals who actually had the full vaccine. Now, 22,000 only had their first dose. That's huge. That's a huge number. So there's still not enough information coming out about the contagious nature of the Delta uh, variant to really put our guard down. It's the other way around. We need to be kind of going back up and putting our guard up, not down. We should be encouraging people to be wearing masks as much as possible. You know, I just had to do an in and out of the trip to the mainland again with my, my work with this and, um, and, you know, uh, my wife and I, my wife joins me, we, we were like wearing our masks and, and you, you people look at you, right? I mean, we're still doing it even though we're fully vaccinated and things. And uh, uh, so I'm just concerned about the Delta variant. I'm concerned about the contagious nature. Now, again, I'm going to highlight the people with the Delta variant did not, or with vaccines and the Delta variant did not die universally, the people who are succumbing to COVID are usually unvaccinated. But again, if look at those numbers, 22,000 plus 8,000, that's 30,000 out of 92, one third of the people got it. Now, what about the ones they spread it to? 
what about the unknowing people? And what about the kids? Or what about the people that are in our church groups that are not getting vaccinated? You saw the cluster reports. You know, we have these concentrations of people who possibly don't believe in it. And perhaps they're, they have faith that they're not going to get it. I'm not going to challenge why or that a church group would have it. But, but that's the way this disease is, is uh is spreading is still spreading exactly the way it spread before in group environments and group indoor environments. So that's what we have to worry about. And that is my concern, you know, the mask mandate, and I'm thankful the governor is still taking this somewhat safe course. I'm concerned that with pressure, you know, he'll cave in and then you'll start seeing clusters popping up and then, and then what, you know, lock him back down again because we cannot control that. that my fear and i think the fear of a lot of the experts that i've listened to is that once we get behind this then it's very hard to catch up it's very hard to get in front of it once we once it, it takes hold and and that is my biggest fear with this variant <clears throat> no going backward that's the thing and see the other thing is on that may 13th decision you can't put the genie back in the bottle to tell people to go back and wear masks. There's, there's it's, you just can't do that. Um, and I can tell you that with the data, cause you guys know I'm, I'm just data walking on this and I deal with people all over the country. There are regions that are county specific, multi-counties and coming now into some bigger urban areas uh, that really are at risk and probably should be shut down already going through the south it is already that bad and uh, you know again it's poorly vaccinated areas there's no doubt but you know what we can't be pushing that right now we're still you know we can't be pointing the finger and saying well hey you should have got your vaccine yeah that's yeah that's uh, sure but you know what but they're americans and and there's still a long way to go and no one deserves to die from this disease if we can prevent it. Everyone should be able to make a decision. Uh, again, I don't agree with it. I'd push the vaccinations, but you can't condemn people to die. Uh, it's just not right. It, any, um, any, I, I know it's, we're after eight, but any um, info on the Lambda variant that has been talking about out of Peru or South America or yeah. any? Anything that new? Um, nothing totally new because we're just getting it to be studied because it came out of uh, out of place a uh, place like Peru and then spread up through some of the areas of Central America. The sequencing has been less than one percent, so there is a uh, very poor. It's a very poor healthcare system, so that the amount of um, detailed investigation that needs to be done to give us the same data uh, is not being done. So, so do not take, I've read a lot about it and some people are brushing it off and saying, well, it doesn't appear to be, we don't know. We don't know at all. We don't know it. We do not know enough to know if it is, you know, another variety of the Delta variant or we just need more data. So what people need to understand, the best thing to understand about the Lambda variant is, you know, this will continue to mutate. There will continue to be variants. And the variants develop for a reason because they make it easier for this virus to spread and to live and to thrive. And that's what coronaviruses do. And there will be more and more and more. And the very strong likelihood is that they're not going to be less virulent or less contagious because that's not what mutations are. Mutations are to keep um, evading our immune system, to be able to keep spreading and to be able to keep alive. And so we are basically going to be living with variants. And just think about this. We started talking about the Delta variant, you know, as it was kind of just terrorizing and, and the poor people in India were dying. That wasn't that long ago. And now it is the number one COVID variant in the United States. What was that? Four months? So these variants 
are very quick to spread and they are going to be worse, not better. So um, masks and social distancing and get your vaccine, get it, get it, get ready for your booster and then get ready for, I'm predicting that we will have a variant that will de develop that will evade a larger portion of what the um, Pfizer or Moderna has offered us, or perhaps J and J, and we're going to have to have a redo of our vaccine to readdress another variant. Can't be 100%, but statistically, looking at history of what the coronaviruses are capable of doing, that is very likely. So, you know, for people to say we don't need boosters coming up, well, we're going to need boosters. You know, it's it's going to happen, and being vaccinated will keep us alive. Hey, Doc. Let me ask you with this variant spreading so quickly, can you pinpoint what, or give your opinion on what seems to be the, the driving force in, 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 in allowing this thing to just spread so quickly at the rate it's, it's doing now? Is there something that, that makes it so different? Yeah, from the, okay. it, it's the same thing that happened from the very first variants that we have. Everybody has seen the picture of that gnarly looking round thing with these big spikes coming out. And at the very end, it's got the little cups on the spikes, right? And those little spikes with the little cups is how that little thing will get up into your nose or back of your throat and suck onto your little receptor and inject its viral um, load into your body. And, and so it replicates. Those spikes and the little cup is where the majority of all of the variants have started to take place. They have made that spike stronger, more resilient and more adhesive so it doesn't break off. And so the key with that is you don't need that many of those little particles now to cause an infection. That's the key. You can just get a fewer droplets in there and it's able to live and thrive and latch on. And that's where the variants are going. And that's why another thing that just drives me up a wall is they're not talking what CDC should be talking about more is, is how you don't have this five, 15 minute and six foot anymore for social distancing. When we're doing our contact tracing, any, you can be exposed to someone for a minute or two and you're in, you're in close contact. No one's talking about that to say, hey, people, if you're exposed to someone and they're positive and it's only a couple minutes because of these new variants, that's a concern, right? That's what the key is for us right now. And that's another word that we need to be standing on mountaintops and saying to people, there's a new uh, form of um, uh, contact tracing that should be done. And that is, you don't need to be around someone without a mask very long and you're gonna catch this. And I think that's where the confusion comes in because the messages we get is like, you know, the, the, the direction of the state is moving to being more relaxed when yet we know that we even haven't seen the full brunt of the Delta yet <clears throat> here in Hawaii, we just, it just started and it's sweeping across the country and it's going to end up here in force. And yet we, we, it doesn't seem to be uh, phasing our, our decision makers in any way. They, in fact, are constantly talking about uh, re, uh, re reducing the restrictions, opening up. And I think that's, that's a little scary for me. And uh, one last question, I promise you, Doc. The schools, I know the feds came out and they're talking about kids not having to wear masks in classrooms and, and uh, not having to social distance. And uh, many of our kids can't be vaccinated because they're under 12 years old. What are your thoughts? And I, I, it didn't sound like the governor was going to move forward on that, uh, relieving that restriction. But what are your thoughts on, on schools? Oh, oh boy, we could do a whole show on this, and maybe we will. I'll, we'll bring you back, and we will definitely I'll, I'll bring you back. back because I've been very, very active with schools and schools across the country, but also um, I've helped the uh, uh, private schools uh, with their policies. And one school has been a shining light uh, here on the Windward side where I'm at, and I've been uh, on their medical hui is Le Jardin Academy. You know, they opened back up last October 
they haven't had any outbreaks, anything like that going on. They were successful to keep keep the school going. And they've already come back out and said, no, no, masks, you're wearing your masks. You know, they're, they're continuing to have the masks. Um, oh, that's Jerome, Jerome Kim, his brother yeah. is Earl. That, that's the whole tie-in. And Jerome, that's how I'm friends with Jerome because he's part of our advisory group writing the guidelines for the school there. And they are such a shining example of doing it right. You do, uh, so I'm totally against not having masks in unvac- unvaccinated. Uh, just listen to what I just said. They're saying that three feet and we're, we're going to have droplets. We're going to have classes wiped out, you know, where the, the kids are all going to be just, just, just taken out with this because it's so contagious. So um, there has to be masks. And, uh, and then I'm sorry, I got a, I got a little beef. I want to drag. I, it drove me crazy. I saw that they, DOH was all happy that they ran this little pilot with you with UH Jamsom down at some school out in Wyanai to do testing at schools and and um, and then I looked and I shuddered because I saw they were using this test called the um, Abbott Bionax now and it's thirty eight percent accurate it only detects one out of three people who are positive when you do it in this surveillance, we wouldn't touch it for, you know, Olympics or any of these other SEC and sports because it's just so inaccurate. It's cheap, it's easy to get, and they bought a lot of it. And I would shudder if they were saying and trying to tell schools that if they use that test, that they can pat the kids on the back and say they're okay. So there, there's guidelines across the country where they're gonna be trying to test the students um, but, uh, but I'm not going to get into the testing part of it right now. It's masks must happen and appropriate ventilation, outdoor classroom as much as you can go back to the old school of, uh, Socrates and all sit under a tree or something. But, um, yeah, we, we need to work on these school guidelines very much. Protect our teachers too, and protect the kids who are unvaccinated. And the kids that go home with their kupuna. That's right. Exactly. You know, that's 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 the thing that these clowns don't talk about, and don't think about, is that, you know, they know oh, kids are resilient. They don't get that sick. No, but they go home and pass it to someone that is vulnerable, and they die. That's the reality. But that's anyway, that, that's the key we have to always talk about. That we just everybody seems to stop at the at the at just the first degree. Well, you got it. Well, you're young. You're not going to. But what about the people around them? What about maybe someone who had a vaccine doesn't know they have low antibodies because they're on um, rheumatoid arthritis medicine, and they go home and they get it and they get hospitalized. That's happening across the country. It's happening across the world. So. Well, Doc, we will bring you back for an hour on schools. How's that? I'll talk about anything, but uh, yeah, you guys know um, you caught me on a you caught me on a passionate. <laughs> I'm always kind of passionate. I'm, I'm living this, but you know, I, I I just want the best thing for our country, and I want the best thing for everybody, and um, and I just think that. Um, we'll, we'll, we can't compromise, we can't compromise. We have done a great job. I mean, the people of Hawaii, I wanna say this again, who gets the bet most credit for how well the state has done with COVID? Come on, let's not talk about the Department of Health or the government or anything. It's the people, the citizens of Hawaii deserve the credit for us having the best rates of COVID because you know what? We wore our masks. And we did social distance. Yes, the governor made some good decisions to lock us down when he did um, and things, but no, 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 those were part of it. The bigger decision is which we see and you guys see that we've taken it. We care about our kapuna. We care about those who might be sick. And, um, you know, let's just keep that up for the people of Hawaii. That's where we're gonna get get through this and please still get vaccinated. (laughs) Thanks, Doc. Charlie. Well. <laughs> Welcome back, Charlie. We missed you, by the way. <laughs> I missed you folks too. To all of our friends out there. Thank you so much. And thank you, Doc, for joining us on the spur of the moment. We always know that when we have you on, 
We don't know what to expect, but we know we're going to be lessened about <laughs> the virus. And uh, it kind of it kind of opens up, you know, because, you know, like they say, when this thing attacks, it'll attack from every angle. And uh, I'm so glad that you could make it on and give us those angles to watch for. So thank you very, very much. And to our friends out there, you know, Mel and I, we said it from before that, you know, there'll come a point in time where we will have to uh, switch gears. But we hope and pray that throughout this entire year and a half, right, Mel? A year and a half that we've been on with all of our special guests, including the one and only uh, Dr. Scott Miskovich, that you folks have learned something. We all have learned something because our whole goal was just to get the information out. You folks do whatever you want to do with the information. And if it's not for you, then you wait for the next episode that we bring on some more information that maybe you will attend to. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the well wishes and for the comments that we've had over this year and a half. Mel? Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate, man, the with the last, I mean, I no, this might might be the second time we actually yanked somebody from the audience and brought them on the show. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you. I am serious. We do want to bring you back on, Doc. Uh, I know on Tuesday, guys, we have Dr. Dworkin, infectious disease specialist. He's going to be chatting with us about the variants and what, what we can expect. Uh, we'll we'll talk. Uh, we'll schedule up with you, Doc, and get you on. And we'll talk. Uh, focus on on the on the school situation. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always it's always nice having Dr. Miskovich because, I mean, he's he's unbiased. He's just a doctor. He's a expert. He's a testing expert. He's world renowned, and he tells the truth. Tells it like it is. That's all we want. That's all we can ask from our guests. And we appreciate you, Doc. Um, and looking forward to getting back. Uh, getting back, uh, getting you back on very soon. Um, Team USA, go Team USA. We watched what they did for the community at the, I guess it was Punahou. I think they had the public come up. They signed autographs. They did all of that. Yep. What a wonderful sight to see for our kids that could could meet U.S. Olympians. That was awesome. Thank you for what you do, Doc. We will be in touch. All right, everybody. You guys have a wonderful evening. Have a great weekend. We'll see you guys on Tuesday. Seven o'clock, Dr. DeWarkin. You don't want to miss that one. All right, guys. <laughs> He's a good one. Hello, everybody. Aloha. <laughs>